Hello, and welcome to Elevator Pitch Series for the Radiographer. I am Michael, and this is the third video in the series on radiographic imaging. In this video, we are going to be looking at radiographic contrast. We'll be looking at what radiographic contrast is and why it is important. We'll also be learning about something called the scale of radiographic contrast, and last but not least, the numerous factors affecting radiographic contrast. In the previous video, we discussed extensively about radiographic density. We highlighted that density is the degree of blackening on a radiographic image. Radiographic contrast is the difference between the densities of adjacent areas on a radiographic image. Why is it necessary for different areas of an image to have different degrees of blackening? Let us explain using this photograph. Even though this is a black and white image, you can still tell certain features about it. It is clear that the big trees are darker than the smaller trees. You can also tell that the leaves of the trees are darker than the bushes. You can tell all these because, even though it is a black and white image, the degree to which structures are black or white varies. There is a difference in density. This is the same way a difference in density is needed on radiographic images to tell apart different anatomical structures and to differentiate pathology from normal anatomical structures. If everything was the same shade of black or gray, we would not be able to make out any differences. We've learned in the past that a radiographic image can have a high overall radiographic density or a low overall radiographic density. This also holds true for contrast. An image can offer only little differences in density between different structures and be known as a low contrast image. On the other hand, a great difference in density between different structures can exist, and this is known as a high contrast image. The reason why a low contrast image gives little difference in densities is because there are so many densities present on a low contrast image, ranging from light to dark. This long range of densities gives the low contrast image the term, long scale contrast. On the other hand, a great difference in densities exists on a high contrast image because only few densities are recorded on these images. This is why high contrast images are also known as short scale contrast images. It might be tempting to assume that high contrast radiographic images are good and low contrast images are bad. But like the French say, au contraire. That means totally wrong. I think. While a high contrast image allows the viewer to easily make out differences between structures on the image, low contrast images offer up more anatomical and pathological information due to the long range of densities present on the image. Neither type of contrast is ultimately bad, the trick is to find a balance between an image that is long scale enough to provide sufficient diagnostic information and one that is short scale enough to make the differences appreciable. That takes us to the factors that determine whether or not an image would have a high or low radiographic contrast. The first factor is the subject contrast. Now, this might seem a bit tricky at first, but is actually really easy. Let us discuss in clear terms before moving on to more standard definitions. We already know that the radiographic contrast is the difference between densities on an image. The subject contrast is the difference between density or thickness of structures within the anatomy that is being imaged. This difference in thickness determines how the X-ray photons act when they pass through different structures. You see, the photons easily pass through thin structures but are absorbed by thicker structures. Let us go into the more standard definitions. Subject contrast is the difference in intensity of photons emerging from the anatomical part under examination. This difference occurs because the photon is attenuated or reduced in different ways when it passes through different structures. For example, if the chest is being radiographed, photons that would pass through and emerge from the area of the ribs would be greatly reduced compared to photons that would pass through and emerge from the area of the lungs, which would be much less reduced as the lungs are not nearly as thick as the bony tissue of the ribs. Let us explain further using this illustration. Let us imagine this is our X-ray tube, and this on the other hand is our image receptor. This time, let's place an anatomy on the image receptor. Picture this as a part with structures of similar thickness, a low subject contrast part. Then, here's our X-ray beam. Let's place three hypothetical photons in our X-ray beam, just for simplicity, photons normally travel in millions. What happens when our three photons pass through this structure with low subject contrast? They go through, receive the same degree of attenuation and get to the image receptor, looking alike. Thus, the image produced will have similar densities across the image, producing a low radiographic contrast. This explains why plain radiographs of the abdomen are of low radiographic contrast, 
The abdomen contains mainly soft tissue of similar thickness. This time, let us imagine there is higher subject contrast due to the presence of a thicker structure within the part, made of mainly soft tissue. Think of bone or contrast media. Now, what would happen? Watch what happens when our three photons try to pass through this anatomical part. You would observe that only two out of the three photons make it to the image receptor. One is absorbed completely by the thicker structure. This implies that certain areas of the image receptor would have less photons than other areas due to these differences in photon attenuation. This produces an image with higher radiographic contrast. That takes us to the next factor affecting radiographic contrast, the kilovoltage. In the video on prime factors, we learned how the KV selected determines the speed and energy at which photons travel. In turn, the speed and energy of a photon determines how well a photon can penetrate tissues. A high-energy photon would pass through most structures easily, while a low-energy photon will be attenuated by many structures. This means that, if the KV is too high, the photons would have sufficient energy to penetrate all structures under examination, no matter how thick they are. Thus, there would be little or no difference in attenuation of the photons, and the image would have low radiographic contrast. When the KV is reduced, photons in the direction of thick structures would be greatly attenuated, while those moving in the direction of thinner or no structures at all would make it to the image receptor with less attenuation. This is known as differential attenuation and will produce an image with higher radiographic contrast. From all that has been said so far, it is safe to say that as KV increases, the subject contrast and radiographic contrast both decrease and vice versa. This is why the KV is known as the major controlling factor for radiographic contrast. Next, scattered radiation. In the videos on control of scattered radiation, under our radiographic equipment playlist, we highlight how thick anatomical parts, a wide beam and a high kilovoltage produce scattered radiation which forms useless densities that do not represent the anatomy under examination. These useless densities reduce the radiographic contrast by making it difficult to differentiate the useful densities from each other. Think of it this way, if you have a sentence written out clearly, it is easy to make out the characters and make adequate meaning of what is written. If you have the sentence written again but this time with useless characters introduced around it, even though your useful sentence is still there, it is much more challenging to make it out this time. This is the same effect scattered photons have on radiographic contrast. What this implies is that any effort to reduce scatter would increase the radiographic contrast. The next factor affecting radiographic contrast is the use of intensifying screens. This applies only to film screen radiography. When intensifying screens are used, a multiplier effect on photon production occurs. Apart from this effect of increasing the amount of photons reaching the film, intensifying screens have also been observed to produce greater contrast when they are used, compared to when they are not. Next, also applying only to film screen radiography, is the processing conditions. As mentioned in the previous video, images are made visible by a process called development in film screen radiography. The activity of the chemical responsible for development depends on its temperature and the time spent developing. At high temperatures and long development times, great density is recorded. However, if the developer activity is too high, due to too high temperature or too long development time, a problematic effect occurs. This is called chemical fogging, and it is the formation of useless densities on the image. This decreases the radiographic contrast. Think of it the same way our text in scattered radiation was affected. The useful densities are there, but because there are also useless densities, making out the useful is harder. In this video, we have looked extensively at one type of contrast. Let us conclude by briefly talking about the types of contrast. First is the subject contrast, which we mentioned earlier in this video. It is simply the difference between thickness of structures within a part. Next is the radiographic or object contrast, which this video is based on. It is the difference in optical densities recorded on different parts of a radiograph. The third type of contrast is subjective contrast. This is a personal appreciation of the differences in densities recorded. It varies from observer to observer, hence the term subjective. What one person considers as high contrast can be seen as low contrast by another observer. It depends on the experience, level of fatigue and eyesight of the observer. It also depends on the ambient lighting of where the image is being looked at among others. That concludes this video on radiographic contrast. We look forward to your questions and comments in the comments section or via email.
If you love this video and would want more content, please subscribe and share with your colleagues. Until next time, do enjoy the learning process and take care.